Hello, boys and girls. Today is Tuesday, and I am going to be reading Out of Little House in the Big Woods, Chapter 8, Dance at Grandpa's House. I am going to be reading Out of Little House in the Big Woods uh, with permission from Harper Collins Publishers. All right, I am on page 131, Dance at Grandpa's. So please get your book out and let's start reading page 131. Monday morning, everybody got up early in a hurry to get started to Grandpa's. Paul wanted to be there to help with the work of gathering and boiling the sap. Ma would help Grandma and the aunts make good things to eat for all the people who were coming to the dance. So this was not uncommon in the pine, for the pioneer way of life. Um, families would get together and they would bring friends and they would have this big old dance at somebody's house. And it was just a fun time um, that they could hang out together and eat, have fun. So something that they would do back then. Breakfast was eaten and the dishes washed and the beds made by lamplight. Paul packed his fiddle carefully in its box and put it in the big sled that was already waiting at the gate. Now, can we infer that they are ready to go? That Paul is ready to get there quick? That's right, he is. He wants to help out with the preparation. We're at the top of 132. The air was cold and frosty and the light was gray when Laura and Mary and Ma with baby Carrie were tucked in snug and warm under the robes on the straw in the bottom of the sled. The horses shook their heads and pranced, making the sleigh bells ring merrily, and away they went on the road through the big woods to Grandpa's. The snow was damp and smooth in the road, so the sled slipped quickly over it and the big trees seemed to be hurrying by either side. After a while, there was sunshine in the woods and the air sparkled. The long streaks of yellow light lay between the shadows of the tree trunks and the snow was colored faintly pink. All the shadows were thin and blue and every little curve of snowdrifts and every little track in the snow had a shadow. Paul showed Laura the tracks of the wild creatures in the snow at the side of the road, at the top of page 133. The small leaping tracks of cottontail rabbits, the tiny tracks of field mice, and the feather stitching tracks of snowbirds. There were larger tracks, like dog tracks, where foxes had run, and there were the tracks of the deer that had bounded away into the woods. The air was growing warmer already, and Paul said that the snow wouldn't last long. Now remember, it's spring. It did not seem long until they were sweeping into the clearing at Grandpa's house, all the sleigh bells jingling. Grandma came to the door and stood there smiling, calling to them to come on in. She said that Grandpa and Uncle George were already at work out in the maple woods. So Paul went to help them, while Laura and Mary and Ma, with baby Carrie in her arms, went into Grandma's house and took off their wraps. Laura loved Grandma's house. It was much larger than their house at home. Turn the page. There was one great big room, and then there was a little room that belonged to Uncle George, and there was another room for the aunts, Aunt Dosia and Aunt Ruby. And then there was the kitchen with the big cook stove. So the aunts and one uncle lived with Grandma and Grandpa. It was fun to run the whole length of the big room from the large fireplace at one end all the way to gram Grandma's bed under the window in the other end. The floor was made of wide, thick slabs that Grandpa had hewed, hewed from the logs with his axe. The floor was smoothed all over and scrubbed clean and white, and the big bed under the window was soft with feathers. The day seemed very short while Laura and Mary played in the big room and Ma helped Grandma and the aunts in the kitchen. The men had taken their dinners to the maple woods. So for dinner, they did not set the table, but ate cold venison themselves, venison sandwiches, and drank milk. But for supper, Grandma made hasty pudding. She stood by the stove, sifting the yellow cornmeal from her fingers into a kettle of boiling salted water. She stirred the water all the time with a big wooden spoon 
and sifted in the mill until the kettle was full of a thick yellow bubbling mess. Then she set it on the back of the stove where it would cool, cook slowly. It smelled good. The whole house smelled good with the sweet and spicy smells from the kitchen, the smell of the hickory logs burning with clear bright flames in the fireplace, and the smell of a clove apple beside grandma's mending basket on the table. Remember the, the apple I showed you in a picture with cloves all in it? Oh, that would smell up the whole house. The sunshine came in through the sparkling window panes and everything was large and spacious and clean. At supper time, Paul and Grandma, Grandpa came from the woods. Each had on his shoulders a wooden yoke that Grandpa had made. It was cut to fit around their necks in the back and hollowed out to fit over their shoulders. From each end hung a chain with a hook and on each hook hung a big wooden bucket full of hot maple syrup. Hmm, so earlier we talked, we, we, they mentioned the word sap. Sap comes from trees and we use, they use sap to make maple syrup, okay? For like pancakes and, and other things that they made. Remember the snow, the sugar snow, the candy they made with the syrup and the snow? All right, turn the page. We're on page 136. And in the picture here at the top of page 136, you see Grandpa with the wooden thing across, the, across his back. And they had a part of it that was kind of cut out, made kind of a horse, half horseshoe type, that fit into his neck back here. And then that way they could carry these buckets on each side and it would balance. Kind of looks like a scale, doesn't it? Kind of reminds me of a scale. All right, top of page 136. Paul and Grandpa had brought the syrup from the big kettle in the woods. They steadied the buckets with their hands, but the weight hung from the yokes on their shoulders. Grandma made room for a huge brass kettle on the stove. Paul and Grandpa poured the syrup into the brass kettle, and it was so large that it held all the syrup from the four big buckets. So remember, they both had two around their neck. Then Uncle George came with a smaller bucket of syrup, and everybody ate the hot, hasty pudding with maple syrup for supper. Uncle George was home from the Army. He wore his blue Army coat with the brass buttons, and he had bold, merry blue eyes. He was big and broad, and he walked with a swagger. Laura looked at him all the time she was eating her hasty pudding, because she had heard Paul say to Ma, that he was wild. George is wild since he came back from the war, Paul said, had said, shaking his head as if he were sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Uncle George had run away to be a drummer boy in the army when he was only 14 years old. Laura had never seen a wild man before. She did not know whether she was afraid of Uncle George or not. When supper was over, Uncle George went outside the door and blew his army bugle loud, loud, long and loud. It made a lovely ringing sound far away through the big woods. The woods were dark and silent and the trees stood still as though they were listening. Then from very far away, the sound came back, thin and clear and small, like a little bugle answering the big one. Listen, Uncle George said, isn't that pretty? Laura looked at him, but she did not say anything. And when Uncle George stopped blowing the bugle, she ran into the house. She just didn't know what to think about him. She didn't know if she really cared for him or she didn't. All right, turn the page, the top of page 138. Ma and Grandma cleared away the dishes and washed them and swept the hearth while Aunt Josia and Aunt Ruby made themselves pretty in their room. Laura sat on their bed and watched them comb out their long hair and part it carefully. They parted it from their foreheads to the napes of their neck and then patted it across from ear to ear, kind of like this. They braided their, their back hair in long braids and then they did the braids up carefully in big knots, so like up here. And you'll see it on the next page. 
They had washed their hands and faces and scrubbed them well with soap at the wash basin on the bench in the kitchen. They had used store soap, not the slimy, soft, dark brown soap that Grandma made and kept in a big jar to use for common every day. So this was special soap for a special occasion. They fussed for a long time with their front hair, holding up the lamp and looking at their hair and the little looking glass that hung on the log wall. They brushed it so smooth on each side of the straight white part that it shone like silk in the lamplight. The little puff on each side shone too, and the ends were coiled and twisted neatly under the big knot in the back. You look at the picture here. You'll see how they braided and knotted their hair. They were getting themselves all lovely and pretty for the dance. Okay. We are on the second paragraph here on page 139. Then they pulled on their beautiful white stockings that they had knit a fine cotton thread and lacy open work patterns, and they buttoned up their best shoes. They helped each other with their corsets. Uncle Aunt Dosia pulled as hard as she could on Aunt Ruby. Corset strings, and then Aunt Dosia hung on to the foot of the bed while Aunt Ruby pulled on hers. So they're like pulling her corset. Corset was something that women would wear to just kind of make their dress fit better. And it, they would wear it underneath their dress. Pull, Ruby, pull, Aunt Dosia said, breathless. Pull harder. So Aunt Ruby braced her feet and pulled harder. Aunt Dosia kept measuring her waist with her hands and at last she gasped. I guess that's the best you can do, she said. Caroline says Charles could span her waist with his hands when they were married. Caroline was Laura's ma, and when she heard this, Laura felt proud. Then Aunt Ruby and Aunt Dosia put on their flannel petticoats and their plain petticoats and their stiff, starched white petticoats with knitted lace all around the flounces, and they put on their beautiful dresses. A petticoat was a kind of a skirt underneath their dress, but it was petticoat flared out and would make their dresses flare out, okay? You know how when sometimes you spin around in your dress, it flows out. Girls do this, not the boys. But girls will spin around and then their dresses fly, up, fly around. That's kind of how a petticoat would do, It'd just make the dresses fuller so then when they spun, it was real pretty with their dress, okay? All right, the bottom of page 140. Aunt Dosia's dress was a sprig of print, dark blue, with sprigs of red flowers and green leaves thick upon it. The basque was buttoned down the front with black buttons, which looked so exactly like juicy big blackberries that Laura wanted to taste them. Aunt Ruby's dress was wine-colored calico, covered all over with a feathery pattern in lighter wine color. It buttoned with gold colored buttons and every button had a little castle and a tree carved on it. Aunt Dosia's pretty white collar was fastened in front with a large round cameo pin which had a lady's head on it. Then Aunt Ruby pinned her collar with a red rose made of sealing wax. She had made it herself on the head of the darning needle which had a broken eye so it couldn't be used as a needle anymore. They looked lovely, sailing over the floor so smoothly with their large, round skirts. Their little waist rose up tight and slender in the middle, and their cheeks were red and their eyes bright, under the wings of shining, sleek hair. Ma was beautiful, too, in her dark green delaine, with the little leaves that looked like strawberries scattered all over it. Delaine was a type of fabric. The skirt was ruffled and flounced and draped and trimmed with knots of dark green ribbon and nestling at her throat was a gold pin. The pin was flat, as long and wide and as wide as Laura's two biggest fingers, and it was carved all over and scalloped on the edges. Ma looked so rich and fine that Laura was afraid to touch her. People had begun to come. They were coming on foot through the snowy woods with their lanterns, and they were driving up to the door in sleds and in wagons. Sleigh bells were jingling all the time. 
How much fun? Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? The big room filled with tall boots and swishing skirts and ever so many babies were lying in rows on Grandma's bed. Uncle James and Aunt Libby had come with their little girl, whose name was Laura Ingalls, too. The two Lauras leaned on the bed and looked at the babies, and the other Laura said her baby was prettier than baby Carrie. She is not either, Laura said. Carrie's the prettiest baby in the whole world. No, she isn't, the other Laura said. Yes, she is. Now look at them in the picture. They're fussing, aren't they? They're arguing about who has the prettiest baby, sister. Mm. Okay, let's turn the page. <clears throat> no, she isn't. Ma came sailing over in her fine Delane and said severely, Laura. So neither Laura said anything more because they didn't know who she was talking to exactly, did they? So they, that's how Ma got both of them to be quiet. She just said their name one time. Uncle George was blowing his bugle. It made a loud ringing sound in the big room and Uncle George joked and laughed and danced, blowing the bugle. Then Pa took his fiddle out of its box and began to play and all the couples stood in squares on the floor and began to dance when Paul called the, called the figures. Grand right and left, Paul called out, and all the skirts began to swirl and all the boots began to stamp. The circles went round and round, all the skirts going one way and all the boots going the other way, and hands clasping and parting high up in the air. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna stop there. Um, they are dancing and they are square dancing, okay? That is the name of the type of dancing that they are doing. And if we were having grandparents day at BCS, then we would put on a second grade square dance show. We do that every year for our grandparents. Unfortunately, this year we can't do that. Um, but we're going to read about it and we're going to talk about it, okay? All right, boys and girls, that is all we're going to read today in chapter eight. So we will finish that um, on Wednesday. Tonight you have language um, IXL. It's third grade. You are actually going to put sentences in order and a paragraph, okay? So they're gonna give you a paragraph and it's gonna be your job to figure out what order the sentences need to go in. Okay, so you're able to move sentences around and kind of on top of each other, under each other, and try to put them in order. It's really good practice for when we're doing um, writing paragraphs, like with your narrative or coronavirus, because our, um, our stories need to make sense. They need to flow and they need to be in order, okay? Um, there needs to be also, it's called a sequence. So you're gonna do some practice with that tonight. Um, and so that's what you're doing with language arts. All right, um, don't forget to also do day three in your spiral ELA. All right, boys and girls, we'll see you tomorrow.